Good evening, everyone. I'm um, Simon Keyes. Uh, by day, I teach students about peace building around the world. By night, I'm a Froome resident. <laughs> so welcome to this event on kindness in politics, um, which uh, is going to be a really interesting evening, but it's not quite the evening expected because uh, I'm afraid, as you will see, um, David Warburton is not with us. So when, let me just ask a quick question, little kindness test here, okay? <laughs> when you first heard David Wharton was not going to be here, did you think, A, he didn't want to be mauled by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the political animals of Froome? <laughs> Secondly, B, was it that uh, actually he's a very busy man and actually this wasn't a priority for him? Or was it C, uh, did he have an accident yesterday and is he in hospital today? Uh, Okay, it's C, it's C. So, so if you thought A or B, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to say, though, that we will be joined online shortly um, by uh, um, uh, 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 our uh, um, neighbouring um, MP, um, who is Danny Kruger, uh, the MP for Divisors, Conservative MP. He's also the political secretary to Boris Johnson. So actually, we have a very senior uh, Tory joining us for a while. He won't be able to stay with us all evening, but he will be appearing online fairly shortly. So just briefly to say, we have uh, Professor Barbara Taylor. Barbara, can you hear us? Yep. Excellent. Okay. We've never met until now, but thank you so much for, for uh, agreeing to be with us. Um, and we have John Harris, uh, local boy, great Guardian journalist. I'm from Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if, you, yeah, if you're part of the music scene, you can't come from Froome anyway. But anyway, so, so I, I, I'll say a little bit more about them later. So I'll just give a, a brief introduction um, and then we're going to go to, to, uh, to, to Barbara to, to kick us off. Before I do, however, another little kindness test for Froome. Um, Anita. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Anita Collier. Uh, Deputy Leader of Froome Town Council, and another of my responsibilities is as the twinning councillor, looking after our relationships with our other three twin towns. Uh, we've got twin towns in Chateau Gontier in France, in Murhart in Germany, and in Rabko Zoyt, which is a bit of a mouthful <laughs> at the start of night, uh, in Poland. And of course, that's the twin town that we're currently focusing on because they've been extremely kind in sending dozens and dozens of coaches to the Ukrainian border to pick up refugees. They're planning on taking in over 500 people, maybe six. And of course, we know that the Polish government have been very good in giving uh, an allowance to hotels and guest houses to uh, give accommodation and food to those people. But the families themselves, and they're coming forward by the dozen, are not given anything. And so they are desperate. It's a little town, only half the size of Froome. And in fact, the, the people there are actually not that wealthy. You know, they're, they're often, it's, don't you find it's often people in need who are the most gracious at giving. Um, and Rabka wants to do so much for the Ukrainian people. And so they've asked for our support from the other three twin towns. And we're very happy to give it. So we, as a council, decided that we would like to give a, a donation of £5,000 to Radhika. Uh, and we also thought it would be rather nice to put out an appeal to Froome. And I'm very happy to tell you that of the £10,000 we were hoping to raise, as it stood just before I started speaking, it was at 11500 and growing, which is absolutely amazing. It's a great testament to the people of Froome. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who's contributed to that. Um, the other thing is, of course, on the, at the independent market on Sunday, uh, which we all know happens on the first Sunday of every month, there will be people shaking buckets in the hope that we can also add to that collection and help it grow even faster. All the money, as I say, will be going to Rabka Town Council, working in conjunction with the district, uh, and they will make sure, it'll be a very disciplined process, they will make sure that all the money collected will get through to those families who are hosting Ukrainian uh, people. So we know it's going to work very well. It's a very trusted source. And uh, I'd like to say to any of you, if you have the opportunity and you'd like to donate, that would be wonderful. You can find all the details on Froome Town Council's Facebook page. And if you just scroll down until you come to the appeal, there will be a link to a Just Giving site. 
It's also on the website page. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, so on the website too for Frimtown Council. Thank you very much. I was asked to do one other thing, so I will just quickly do a housekeeping thing. Um, there shouldn't be a fire alarm this evening, but just in case, this would be your exit, and the gathering point is at the entrance to the car park. Okay, thank you. So I'm delighted to say that Dana Kruger has joined us online. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that you're going to listen for a little while and then we'll give you an opportunity to give us some of your thoughts if that's, if that's okay. Yeah, good. So just a very brief in introduction um, here. Um, when this, this um, event was announced, I think it's fair to say I picked up there were some fairly mixed feelings about, about the subject matter, that, that various people felt it was naive to expect kindness to be in politics. Politicians are in it for themselves. Politics is essentially agonistic. It's a struggle, and what we want to talk about is rights, not sentiment. And, and also that the way our constitution works, the English parliament is set up as an adver adversarial operation, which relies on party loyalty. Um, and so often MPs you know, are whipped to follow a particular line, which may not necessarily be uh, the thing they most wanted to, to support. As a result, people feel angry, and we all know there's been a great loss of trust in political leaders. 93% um, of people trust nurses. 13, sorry, 15% of people trust politicians uh, when they're asked, do you trust them to tell the truth? So this is, whilst it's always been low, it's at an all time low at the moment. Um, uh, actually, it's, uh, Barbara, it might be just worth mentioning that professors actually have 83%. Um, John, the bad news is journalists, 23%. Okay. <laughs> um, but, the, but there's a disconnect here because actually in the Southwest, we are the kindest part of the United Kingdom. 59% of people expect people to be kind. And of course, politicians themselves have a lot of experience of giving and receiving uh, kindness. So the, prob the problem here is can what stands in the way of kindness moving into public life? And I think what's particularly, we, and we would all like our politicians to be kinder. We would like our, our, our culture of um, uh, politics to be more compassionate. We would like to be able to trust them more. Um, but what stands in the way? Um, uh, uh, well, um, interestingly enough, there's been a lot of academic and policy work done in the last 10 years, uh, exploring the forms that kindness can take. In the political world and that's what we're really going to try and look at this evening what what is in what way can kindness be expressed through political systems and how can it begin to change uh, those those systems um, the carnegie trust for instance had a very interesting project going looking at the challenges uh, to facing public policy at the moment and they're all things that kindness can have an impact on in scotland you may well know there is something called the national performance framework for scotland a big strategy and their, their values are, we are a society which treats our people with kindness, dignity, and compassion, respects the, the rule of law, and, and, and so forth. So it's happening in Scotland. Uh, maybe the best example in the world is New Zealand. We're going to come to that a, a little later on. But let me just quickly quote from uh, Jacinda Ardern, um, the leader, the, the prime minister. And, she's, and when she's asked what's the most important thing that, that influences her leadership, uh, uh, she says, kindness and not being afraid to be kind or to focus on and be driven by empathy. I think one of the sad things that I've seen in political leadership is that because we placed over time so much emphasis on notions of assertiveness and strength, that we probably assume that it means you can't have those other qualities of kindness and empathy. And yet, when you think about all the big challenges we face in the world, that's the quality we need most. So that's the background to this, this conversation. So uh, our first uh, speaker this evening is Professor uh, Barbara uh, Taylor, who has the fascinating role of joint professors professorship between the schools of history, English and drama at Queen's Mary University, a, a fascinating uh, span of interest there. She's famous for uh, 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 her writing, particularly about Mary Wollstonecraft, um, a fascinating autobiographical book called The Lost Asylum. And more recently, two, and this is the reason I think she's really here tonight, a book on kindness, uh, published a few years ago with Barbara Taylor. And just very recently, a couple of months ago, uh, a fascinating um, contribution to this book, How Compassion Can Transform Our Politics Economy and Society. So, Barbara, um, 
please, uh, 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 if you would like to speak no more than 10 minutes, please, uh, uh, give us some, some background for our discussion here. And then Danny will come to you, if that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. So Barbara, over to you. Well, well first of all, I mean, I mean, thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm very sorry I'm not um, in Somerset with you. Um, I, instead, here I am in um, what we like to know um, here in, um, in my part of London as uh, leafy Tottenham, the Vale of Tottenham, um, as we call it, which is not necessarily how it's usually regarded, but nonetheless, um, in Herringay in London. And um, I think, um, I mean, there's just a few things I want to say, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that they won't take uh, 10 minutes because I'm, I particularly enjoy hearing from audiences at these occasions. So um, I'd really like us to try and leave room to get feedback from people here about what they think about these issues. I, um, I, I, I did say to Simon, can we really be talking about kindness and politics at this particular moment? And, um, uh, and, and I, in regard to that, I just want to say that I, I, um, I had an exchange. The, the book that he just referred to, um, How Compassion Can Transform Our Politics, Economy and Society, is edited by Matt Hawkins and Jennifer Nadel um, of Compassion in Politics. And, um, uh, and I, I really recommend this book to you, not so much for my piece in it as, as actually for other pieces, which, um, uh, I mean, my piece is, is, I mean, it's fine. I can answer questions about it if anyone's read it or read um, the book on kindness that I did, the psychoanalyst about Adam Phillips. But, they, but what really um, struck me um, about, about this book, um, well, first of all, I think is a definition of kindness um, as solidarity and um, being in solidarity with people. And I think that the notion of solidarity is a really important one because what it means is that we don't ask people to be a certain way in order to be kind to them. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that has really corrupted people's ideas about compassion and kindness has been whether or not people are deserving of kindness. Are they innocent? Are they the kinds of people, you know, that, that, that measure up in some way? And um, I mean, and the truth of it is that, I mean, we are all very complicated creatures and the, you know, we're not nice all the time. We're not innocent, certainly. I don't think, I mean, you know, he who can cast the stone. I mean, you know, all of us have um, impulses which can be cruel and aggressive. And there's been a huge amount of, of talk in this country about whether or not people measure up to what's expected. For example, of refugees. I mean, this is a classic example. You know, are they the sorts of people we want in this country? Um, you know, are there, what, what do they bring with them? Instead of just the brute fact of human need and being in solidarity with human need, whatever the character of the person in need. And I think that this is a very, a very important distinction and one that's made by a number of contributors to this book. Um, so that's, that's one big point I wanted to make. Um, I also wanted to um, um, just say a, a, a word about um, being a professor. Sorry, I, I, I'm wearing the wrong, the wrong specs, I just realized. I'm not wearing my sitting at computer specs. So here, get a different version. Um, the, um, uh, as you might expect, I've got a little pile of books next to me then. And um, uh, I want to refer to one that um, many of you may have heard on the radio that um, a new book has just come out um, by um, Peter Hennessy, um, who, um, I, I mean, there's been radio interviews with so on and so forth. He's a professor, um, Peter Hennessy, now Lord Hennessy. Uh, in fact, um, in fact, I took his job <laughs> when, he, when he left. When, I mean, he, he's emeritus Queen Mary, and, um, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I will never measure up to Peter, but, but uh, that was how the job opened up for me um, at Queen Mary. Um, and he has got a new book out called, um, and I, I'll just hold it up for you. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think it's, well, you can see it, A Duty, A Duty of Care. And um, 
I haven't had the chance to read it all. It's only just arrived. But um, one of the main points that Peter makes is that uh, is about the pandemic. And what he has to say about it is that, um, in, in a sense, he says, we've all become historians now um, because we've lived through a period which, I mean, many, many people have been sort of, you know, diarizing and um, make, keeping records of their experiences um, during um, the pandemic. Um, the experience of the belt, but also, I mean, this great upwelling of mutual aid that uh, I, I don't know what the situation has been like in Somerset, but very soon on in the pandemic, um, you know, I was receiving things through uh, my letterbox from people in the street, from people in the neighborhood saying, can we do anything for you? Can we help you out? Um, asking me if there were things I could do for people. I mean, all sorts of stuff started happening. I mean, everyone will re recall this, especially from the period of lockdown. And what Peter has to say about that, um, I mean, the book is very much, I won't go into it. I, I mean, the book is very much about um, the world of beverage in 1945 and the foundings of the welfare state and whether or not the spirit uh, behind that can in some sense be recovered now in this very, very different political climate that we have in this country um, of so-called austerity, welfare cuts, and so on and so forth. I don't need to rehearse um, uh, my view of the current government with you. Um, but, um, but what Peter says is that we have rediscovered, he thinks, a shared duty of care in an intense form between government and people and between individuals. And I think that's right. I think we have passed through, are passing through a care crisis in this country, uh, a crisis in which we are all involved wherever we position ourselves. Um, you know, whether it's, it's it, our, our, our older parents we're caring about, whether it's children we're caring about, whether it's our disabled next door neighbor we're caring about, whether it's ourselves, our needs, you know, the things that's, that are happening to us right now, whether it's our delivery drivers, you know, super exploited people. And so I'm just going to mention, so that I don't go on for too long, um, another book which um, if you haven't read it, it's a very tiny little book um, uh, and um, uh, authored by um, a group that calls itself the Care Collective. Um, I, I happen to know a number of people in this collective, particularly um, the um, very, very well-known um, feminist writer and theorist, um, Lynn Siegel, who's done a huge amount of work on care and the politics of care. And here we have, and it's a little, little book called The Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence. And I think this is also, I mean, this uh, is one of the, the best, uh, along with Peter's book. I mean, there's, a, there's no host of books coming out um, uh, because I think people really feel that we are in the middle of a crisis of care in this country, which I suspect is one of the reasons why Simon has brought us together today. Um, I asked Matt Hawkins a question. Matt Hawkins, the editor of the book that Simon referred to, How Compassion Can Transform Our Politics, et cetera. I asked him a question um, this morning uh, in an email exchange when I said I was proud to be included in this book, which I think is so excellent. Um, I said, what makes Putin's possible. And um, because I deeply believe that human beings have a huge capacity for kindness, all human beings. The argument of, in my chapter is that, is that this is something which is intrinsic to, um, to human beings. It's the old argument that Jean-Jacques Rousseau made that I'm sort of resurrecting. I'm giving it a slightly different twist for our times through um, more modern forms of thinking. But if that's the case, how do we explain the people who in some sense become monsters, who abandon 
this fundamental aspect of human nature. And in that sense, I think can be described truly as lunatic. And Matt said he didn't know the answer to that question, um, but that he was discussing it with people, that there was going to be discussion of it. Um, and I'll be very interested to know what comes of it, because I think it's a it's an urgent, urgent question for our times when many people seem somewhere, somewhere along the way to have lost one of the most important and joyful aspects of being a human. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And we'd very much like to, do, to involve you in the conversation a little later on, if you can stay online for a while, that would be great. So I think now if we can move to, uh, to Danny Kruger. First of all, thank you very, very much indeed for standing in at short notice for, for uh, David Woolworth. And I think he probably owes you a pint, uh, but it's very, very kind of you. Um, a little bit about Danny, for those of you who don't know him, he's the MP for Devizes, uh, grew up in a farm in Wiltshire. Uh, his main career has been uh, working in the community. Uh, he founded a project, uh, 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 working in prisons to stop criminals reoffending, he ran it for 10 years, and also set up a charity in West London, uh, uh, looking at coordinating support for young people at risk. I think that's right, isn't it? Uh, you then moved in, you were a journalist for a while, and then moved into politics. Um, and, uh, and most recently, you've been political secretary to the prime minister, no less. So, uh, so it's great to have you with us. Very kind of you to, to, to join us. Uh, I wonder if you would like to share a few thoughts on the possibilities of creating a kind of politics. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased to, this is so interesting. What an interesting conversation and event. Um, I don't mind being the stand-in. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here at all. Um, I actually grew up in Oxfordshire, not Wiltshire. I am now an MP in Wiltshire. Um, and I don't know Froome at all, other than by reputation as this really innovative, entrepreneurial uh, and, um, and sort of community-minded place, which is a template, I think, for how towns could and should be. Um, I don't know how, what, what the state of your politics is now, but I, I remember reading some years ago about the innovations and developments there uh, and the way local people, as it were, took over the town from the political parties. Not something I recommend, uh, but I admire and I, um, I mean, genuinely think, think we need innovations in democracy. It's something I've, I've spoken and written about. Uh, and so I am inspired by by the story of Prue. Um, yes, yeah, so I so I did. I've done mostly sort of charity work uh, with, with prisoners, ex offenders, young youth at risk. But I've also had a political career sort of alongside that. And I actually worked for David Cameron back when he was opposition leader. And I wrote his famous speech that became characterised "Hugger Hoodie." If you remember that uh, from two thousand and six, I think, uh, in which we argued that um, that love. Uh, and and kindness, I'm sure we used the word, um, is the first uh, and most effective crime fighting uh, device before we get into punishment and deterrence, uh, although we need those things too. Um, and, uh, uh, and as you've just heard, I've sort of done, done a bit of that in my in my work. And then since becoming an MP, I, I just heard about the, um, and Barbara was talking about the upsurge in neighbourliness and community spirit that we've seen during the pandemic. It has been the most tremendous and inspiring thing. And I wrote a report for the Prime Minister after the first lockdown, so back in 2020, saying with, with a whole bunch of ideas about how we can capitalise on this and how we can properly make this neighbour to neighbour uh, social solidarity part of the ongoing settlement, as it were, the system, part of the system, rather than to external to the system. Uh, and that 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 report, the government's picking up a whole bunch of ideas around that. So 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 I, I, I'm very much. I'm, I, I say all that in order to justify what I'm about to say next, which is probably a bit more controversial. Um, I say all that to say basically yes, of course I agree, and I hope my work up till now has uh, has 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 um, as it were tried tried to give that effect to the principles of kindness in in social life. But I do have a bit of an uh, disagreement with the idea that kindness is a sufficient principle that should uh, dominate our politics. I suppose I was interested in the in the Jacinda Ahern quote uh, that you read out earlier: "Kindness is the quality you need most." Um, 
It might well be, uh, but there's a reason, as, as we heard in the introduction, why politics is adversarial. Um, uh, and it is naturally adversarial. Um, and it's not just because the design of the House of Commons, which is this sort of college chapel setup where the two sides face each other, that's just an accident of history. Politics naturally resolves itself into an argument because what we're trying to do is, in politics is to is to enfran the, 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 the discord in politics enfranchises the public. Imagine if all we were doing were agreeing was agreeing with each other. Imagine if there was just a cosy consensus among the politicians that they sought at all times to find reasons for agreement. Actually, what you get, I'm afraid you get too much of that in government as it is. You get meetings with politicians, civil servants, uh, other advisors, all being extremely nice to each other. And the real differences that exist in the topic you're discussing are not properly aired because everyone's being too nice to each other. And there's a sort of group think that develops and a consensus all built, built out of the ideas of courtesy uh, and not, not, not sort of breaking the, the nice atmosphere. Uh, and if anybody disagrees with anybody, someone says, let's take this offline, meaning let's discuss this after us. We don't want to break the cosy conversation we're having. Whereas if you have what you have in the House of Commons, which is two sides, basically thinking quite, thinking the worst of the other side and trying to prove it the whole time, you are thereby creating a space in which the public can make a real choice. Now, I couldn't agree more about if, you're, if anybody thinks the House of Commons is, a, is pretty puerile, childish, adversarial, I mean, too adversarial in its tone often. I, I hate Prime Minister's questions. Um, but actually, there is a reason why we have two sides and why they argue, argue very publicly, uh, because it, it, it's a way of bringing the public into the conversation meaningfully. Um, and the business of politics is to... Um, is to broker disagreements. Uh, you know, the word comes from Aristotle, whose book, book The Politics, the first line of which is, you know, how shall men live together? How shall people manage their common life in a polis, in a city, uh, when they don't all agree? And that's what the business of politics is, brokering disagreements. Um, and that needs to be adversarial, also dialectical, so that disagreements get resolved uh, through conflict. So I don't think that, um, we should bemoan disagree political disagreements, even when they get quite heated. And I don't agree with Barbara about Rousseau. I, I mean, she, she, I'm, I'd be interested to know, to, to know how she's modernised Rousseau. But I mean, I, I think that the, the primary fact of human nature is not our goodness, but our capacity for evil. And the purpose of civilization is to educate us in the virtues whereby we treat each other well. Whereas Rousseau thought that we're born good and that society corrupts us and that we need to be we need, we need the corrupt institutions of society to be stripped away so that our natural goodness can emerge. I just don't think that's the experience of anyone's actual life. Um, nor of Rousseau's, of course, who, who was a pretty appalling individual to the people around him. Um, so I think the opposite, uh, and that actually we need a politics which mediates our capacity for harm. Um, just, to, just to wrap up, I... Um, I very much agree with the, I mean, I'm also inspired by what Scotland and Wales actually as well have a well-being framework for their budget setting, I think, um, and New Zealand. I think these are really impressive and interesting models and, and the government in the UK is also developing ways of calculating public value in a way that isn't purely economic and isn't just fixated on GDP. It thinks about social value and a wider set of, a wider sort of basket of measures that just that determine whether uh, a policy or an investment is sensible or not. Um, we're not we're not nearly as far along as those other countries, but I think that I, I think I think the world is is going towards a sort of well-being framework for politics, which is really encouraging. Um, but as I say, uh, I think kindness is we, we obviously need more of it. But I think if we set it as the only quality, we'll end up with a pretty poor politics, and actually one that isn't kind ultimately. And I mean, I you know Barbara mentioned refugees. If we think that the only thought we should have in our head is kindness towards the refugees we're aware of, the ones who make it to these shores or the ones we see on our screens. If, if we think that is the only consideration, um, then obviously the result, the answer to that is com a completely open border policy and, and a deliberate decision to try and trans transport every refugee in the world to, 
to our country, that would not end up with a satisfactory outcome for those people or for the people who are here. There has to be other considerations than, than simply our compassion for the people we see. Um, and you know that is that's that's that is politics. I mean, another one I'm very conscious of today because I've been dealing with it a lot. And no doubt you have it in Broome and elsewhere. Is uh, there's a huge outpouring of generosity going on at the moment. People wanting to, to give blankets and toys and nappies and um, uh, aid, material aid to the Ukrainian refugees. And what's happening is that the roads of Europe are being clogged up with transit vans uh, getting stuck at borders, uh, heading to Poland uh, and Hungary. And those countries are saying, we can't cope with these with this deluge of, of, of aid. There is a better way of organizing our compassion. Um, so, I mean, it's a rather obvious point, but I think, you know, kindness has to be always um, sensible. Um, uh, and I worry a bit about a politics that basically by which kindness is a, just a sort of proxy for, um, for, 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 for sort of a, an unthinking generosity, which doesn't ultimately help with people who are trying to help. I do agree about the care crisis. So I won't go on about that, but I think I'm sure Barbara and I I'm sure I'm on the same page as her with that. This is the great crisis of our times is, in this country, is, is, the, is, the, is the crisis in care, adult social care, children's services, children care for, and for working age people. And we need a politics of re relationship. We need to prioritize the relationships in the care system um, uh, and design a new, a new system that is, one, that is genuinely kind in its effect. So those are my thoughts. Um, back to you. Thank you very much indeed for, for, for that. Um, uh, I, I know you're not able to stay with us the whole meeting. We do stay as long as you can and, and listen to some of the other points that are going to come up and feel free to interject with a question or comment if you wish. Um, <clears throat> may I just introduce our, our third speaker who's, who's uh, uh, quite well known around here, John Harris, Guardian columnist, writes on politics, popular culture and music. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, has written some very interesting stuff on music. His famous book, The Last Party, Britpop, Blair and the Demise of English Rock. Uh, sort of eulogy and uh, epiphany, really. I um, also wrote about politics, uh, a fascinating book about 2005 election, so now who do we vote for? But you may well have heard him more recently on Radio 4, he's done a number of programmes on that, an absolutely fascinating series called Citizens of Somewhere. Um, I, I don't know, quite a few heads nodding here, which actually uh, uh, talked about the daily experiences of people, which actually uh, touch on this in a big way. Um, so, uh, John, what do, you, what do you make of this conversation about kindness in politics? Well, um, Danny's a conservative and I'm not. <laughs> um, so in terms of, of most, if not all, of what he said, I disagree with it, which, which points up maybe the, the limits of some of the empathy and kindness that we're talking about. Um, when he said he thought it was a good thing to have two sides in the House of Commons who think the worst of each other, I was struck by that because I don't want a politics like that. Um, a lot of my writing for The Guardian, some of it anyway, <coughs> is actually based on me being very interested in conservatism <coughs> and really trying to alert the people who read The Guardian, you know, by and large, are sort of drawn from the liberal left to the fact that sometimes conservative politics is more complicated than they think. And, um, you know, I understand why people vote conservative. And I, you know, I'm not massively judgmental about that. I would never do it, but um, I get it. And sometimes you have to unpick that and explain to people that the other side isn't evil and bigoted and awful and all of that stuff. And therefore a politics in which each side assumes the worst of each other just sounds to me horribly nasty and dystopian. And I don't want to endorse that. Neither do I want to endorse the idea that every question has two answers. This is something that Danny seems to have in common with crude Marxism, the idea of the dialectic. You know, I don't really buy that. You know, the Scottish independence, for example, is one of several options you can present Scotland with. You know, there's Devo Max, but you know, various gradations of home rule, or you can hand all the power back to London, or you can go fully independent. And within that, there are several options and so on and so forth. So, um, I think our politics suffers very often 
from that constant sense of binary divide. And the other thing is technology has made that worse or social media has made that worse. Because what goes viral very often is stuff which speaks to this imagined binary divide on everything, right? So I notice if I write a piece for the paper, which emphasizes nuances and says, well, you should, you know, you should listen to some of the conservatives. That's some of the stuff work Danny's done, incidentally. So I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but Danny did some work early in the Cameron period about the notion of fraternity and so on, which I found really, really interesting and about how conservatism perhaps had to have some of those ideas of solidarity and so on more in mind. But if I, if I write that and I stick that on Twitter, it's just, I just get tumbleweed, right? <laughs> if I write Boris Johnson's a lying git, you know, it goes through the roof. Um, so I think that's exacerbated these problems, but I think there's a sort of a necessity to separate out two questions within this conversation. So there's the question about how politicians treat each other and whether or not we need, we need a more sort of civil standard of debate, whether the prime minister telling that awful lie about Keir Starmer, which I won't go into the other week is, is terribly helpful and what that does to the sort of standard of public discourse and so on, right? So that's one set of questions. And I think that I think that's got worse, very definitely. Um, and I worry, you know, if you look at what's happened in the states, for example, you know, I read a piece in the London Review of Books this week as, as a review of a book, as a spate of these books about the idea that America will inevitably tumble into the civil war and so on, and how how on earth you bring blue and red states back together. Some of that is specifically American, but I also fear that some of these forces that I've mentioned about are pushing all of us in that direction. And I think we have to be very wary of it. But there's another question within all this, which is to do with policy, it's to do with the sort of um, understanding of people and society that politicians have in mind when they pursue particular aims and objectives. And one of the problems I have with politics and conservative politics in particular, and notwithstanding that slightly more nuanced view of it, I sometimes have, is that very often it seems to assume the worst of people. So Danny talked about the fact that early in the Cameron period, when he was jumping around the place, talking about hug a hoodie and uh, vote blue, go green and all that stuff, which didn't, a lot of which didn't seem to amount to very much at all once he got into power. What replaced it was austerity, was cuts, right? Now, even, even if you were open to the economic argument in favour of cuts, very often what those cuts resulted in was a sort of institutionalized cruelty, um, which was then sold to the public as the idea that this was some reckoning that was always coming and there was something decadent about this. Now, there's nothing decadent about having a decent standard of school transport if you've got a child with special needs or a decent care package if you're an adult with learning disabilities, right? And I've watched all those things be attacked effectively and politicians thinking that there's votes in that attack. And that's very difficult to stomach. And I don't think that has anything to do with kindness at all. Danny talked about neighborliness. The one bit of oratory that I heard from a conservative politician in that Cameron period about people and their neighbors that really sticks in my mind was when George Osborne was talking about what he calls welfare, I call social security. But, and he was saying that people who go to work, he conjured up this image, of them walking past their neighbor's window and the curtains were closed because the person behind was, this is a quote, sleeping off a life on benefits. And that was really the rhetorical justification for the way that the benefit system went and remains during that period, which was manifested in benefit sanctions. Now, Danny's an MP and probably sees in his casework, the people on the receiving end of benefit sanctions, they were withdrawn in the pandemic, but they're, they're, it looks like they're starting to return. If you meet people who've had their benefits stopped, very often they're in a situation of starvation. I've met people who stay in bed all day because that preserves calories. I met a guy in Wigan who for three weeks had his benefits stopped unfairly because he was, you know, 10 minutes late for his interview at the job centre. We all know how this works. And he lived on nothing but potato soup for two weeks. He was starving, effectively. Um, that's not kindness. That's an that's it was as, to use this term that I used a moment ago, that's institutionalized cruelty. Um, and we've seen it lately, you know. I, I spoke to a, 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 an array of people about two or three weeks ago, these are ordinary people from all over the country, about the effects of the thousand pound cut in universal credit after the uplift early in the pandemic. And these are, we all know this, and just because they're sort of cliches, it doesn't detract from their power. These are people who are having to choose between heating their house 
and feeding their kids. So in that sense, talking about kindness in politics, when you've got those sorts of things happening and being encouraged and indulged by politicians is very, very difficult. And I think the same, on a, to take a topical issue, applies to our approach to refugees. Now, Danny talks about competing imperatives in our approach to refugees. Now, I, this might be me being naive, and someone will have to Google this, but as far as I understand it, if someone is a genuine refugee, you have to accept them. There's no other competing imperative there. If someone comes to your country and says, well, I'm in fear of my life, and I'm being politically oppressed, and so on, as people from Ukraine are in precisely that situation, there are no other competing imperatives at all. You have to accept them. The problem is, not just from conservatives, this goes back to the Labour government uh, when he used to talk about bogus asylum seekers and so on. We've encouraged a culture in which, again, we think the worst of people. So once you start to make out that people's claims for asylum, large numbers of people's claims for asylum and refugee status are somehow disingenuous, that then feeds the idea that you should be really, really distant about these things. You know, and then you end up with the spectacle of a home secretary talking about the most awful methods of turning people back in the channel and effectively um, doing away with uh, routes of passage for refugees into Britain. And then the, only, the other thing I wanted to say was this. When Danny talked about the dangers of groupthink and so on and, con and consensus, well, this, this way of thinking that these things are to be avoided within conservative politics really took root in the, in the era of Margaret Thatcher. And if you think back, you know, I was only nine years old and she took power. I was fully aware of how dreadful it was. But uh, anyway, <laughs> we'd had groupthink and consensus and all those things that we're told are so awful. For most of the years after the Second World War, this comes back to the Peter Hennessy book Barbara talked about, which I've read half of, and half of it is about the post-war period. And we had groupthink and consensus then. And that groupthink and consensus was largely or partly based around a fundamental notion of kindness. It was based around the idea that there were certain social standards below which people shouldn't fall. And that if you were a member of, of society, you had duties to society, but society and government, the state more to the point, had obligations to you. And all of that was enshrined or embodied in the post-war welfare state. That was, that was the sort of, and, and decent and plentiful social housing and all of that. And that was the focus of the group thing that ran between Harold Macmillan and Clement Attlee and Rab Butler and Hugh Gateskill and all of those people. And I'd like some of that group think back. And it's, I think it's a shame that we lost it. And on that note, I'll end. <laughs> may I, um, may I drop it again? So rather than invite uh, Danny, you oh, to go on. Would you like I'm to comment sorry, on that? Because I yeah, must, I must, make a comment I, and then we'll go down to something else. <laughs> I'm sorry, I must, I must go, I'm afraid. So I just thought I'd quickly jump back in if I may just for a moment but rather looks like me running away from John there who um I I, I didn't realize you had on the panel I'm an enormous fan and he's absolutely right he he does really good work to explain the weird beast conservatism uh to his guardian readers and uh, um I have a lot of respect for the way he does that um and I, I respect a lot of the I mean I, I agree with a lot of the critique of Thatcherism so I'm on the communitarian side of the conservative party uh and I understand the argument very much, uh, as do many of my Red Wall colleagues, new Tory MPs from, from the former uh, mining areas in particular, who recognise what Thatcherism did to those communities. Uh, so I'm not going to stick up for all of it, uh, other than to observe that something had to change in the 1970s. Uh, and the caricature of Thatcherism isn't always fair. But, but, uh, but let me just accept that for the sake of argument and say, where are we now? And John talked about welfare over the last 10 years. And again, some justice in that. I'm not a great fan of everything that George Osborne did and the way that the, the axe fell and where it fell and the way it was delivered. But my particular critique actually is that what we did was we salami sliced, uh, it's quite swingent, quite swingingly in many cases, uh, using the current model, which was a universal comprehensive system that was essentially unrelational in its approach universal entitlements and th those were just those were just substantially reduced for many people 
and then as you say these sanctions had to be introduced the whole what we've ended up with is a computerized algorithm driven bureaucracy and it can either be more or less generous depending on how, how much money the the government wants to give it but it's essentially a, an unrelational system and what we need is a relational system and john mentioned wigan as it happens an admirer of what the labor council did in wigan over the years of austerity which was to actually they cut their own back office in order to preserve frontline services but crucially then brought in civil society they trusted the community and residents themselves to take more responsibility for uh for, for, for public services and for reducing demand on the on the system so the wigan approach the wigan model i think is the one that we could apply more which is a, a much more relational more human system that isn't obsessed with having you know universal blanket systems that are ultimately just empower computers um, likewise with refugees we just mentioned the, the the answer there and i'm pleased that the government this week has has really gone for it because we've had a system in this country in a very small scale for the last five years uh, of community sponsorship inspired by the canadian approach from going back decades to the to the vietnamese boat people in canada they refugees are are sponsored by community groups often churches but community groups in general we're now going to do that very much with the with the ukrainian refugees that we're going to be taking so rather than just in a in a rather bureaucratic and, and uh sort of soulless way letting telling councils right you've got to look after this number of refugees we're inviting communities to step forward and say we will host support sponsor and properly introduce into the community uh families of refugees so it's that relational model which i think is the right one for accommodation refugees i'm sure there'll be a lot of a lot of that happening in Somerset and Wiltshire. Um, so with that, I, I, I must leave you, but thank you for very much indeed for having me. Um, really, really uh, invigorating. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I'd just like to briefly bring in one other person to this conversation. We have a, a short video to play of Jacinda Ardern, who I mentioned, talking about uh, the way she is the Prime Minister of New Zealand as a try to bring about the cultural and ethical change in the leadership of the nation. Um, so can we show that? Yeah. And for those of you online, the, we have this most amazing IT team here in the town hall and you should be able to see this video as well as we do. So, and you, Barbara. So. I misspoke too soon. We can see it, but we can't hear it. I was saying I didn't like Margaret Thatcher either. <laughs> who was that bloke? <laughs> He's saying, who was that bloke? Who was that bloke? So, in practical terms, what does it mean? Well, this budget, any minister who wants to deliver a bid and say, I want to spend some money here, has to show how it will benefit us at an intergenerational level. They also have to work with other ministers. So the Minister of Health might want to work with the Minister of Child Poverty and start delivering uh, interventions that make a difference 30 years down the track. We as politicians aren't going to benefit from some of that intervention. Uh, and so some of the work we're doing now um, will probably will reap the benefits in 20 years time. But if you start looking at a lens of politics through what we like to use, kindness, empathy, well-being, then actually it doesn't matter what happens just in a political cycle. It what ha matters what happens over decades. But there's another reason I think it needs to be taken seriously. I mean, right here at the World Economic Forum, we've heard uh, you know, discussion around what's happening to global growth rates, uh, discussion around what's happening to trade. Now, those might be conversations we're having separately, but actually, if you distill down what's happening to trade uh, and some, some of our tit-for-tat trade wars, it's become a proxy for dissatisfaction domestically. Some might argue that's what Brexit is. Some might argue some of the other uh, uh, populist uh, uh, rises that we've seen within Europe, that they are proxies for dissatisfaction. Our people are telling us that politics is not delivering and meeting their expectations. Yep. And so this is not woolly, it is critical. This is how we bring meaning and results for the people who vote for us 
Uh, and it's not ideological either. It doesn't have to be something just progressive governments do. I think it is about finally saying this is how we match expectations and try and build trust back into our institutions again, no matter where we are in the world. So, so Barbara, can I just ask you for a quick reaction to that? I don't know how familiar you are with New Zealand politics, but are you impressed by that approach? Uh, well, of course. I mean, I mean, who isn't? Um, I mean, we've all watched, um, you know, the, the, the New Zealand uh, in action. And, um, uh, and you know, I sat there just thinking, oh, my God. I mean, you know, if only, if only, if only. Um, I've been to New Zealand. I have friends there. When I speak to them, they, boy, I mean, are they happy? <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say quickly that, uh, I mean, uh, John Harris said much better than I could, um, although I would, I mean, this, that was, it's perfectly clear, uh, I think, uh, you know, that he and I are essentially um, talking on the, the same page, um, although his sophistication about the current political situation uh, far, far exceeds mine. But um, I, I think the, I just want to say that the little disagreement about Rousseau is actually, I think, more significant perhaps than people realize, <laughs> because, um, this um, cynicism about about human nature, um, I think, is uh, really core to certain um, forms of conservative thinking, um, stretching right back um, to Thomas Hobbes um, and the war of all against all. That human human beings are essentially um, self motivated, selfish, um, out for themselves, and so on. And um, I have to say that. Um, this conservative government to me is an absolute embodiment of that. But I mean, there is so much to say about that and I will simply become polemical, which, um, and I absolutely do take the point that we have to learn to listen to each other. That if we live inside echo chambers as the, as the commonplace goes, and it's a really important one, one of the things that people said again and again and again about Brexit, you know, was that on both sides, people had stopped listening to each other. Had, and social media has a great deal of responsibility for this. The Murdoch press has huge responsibility for this. So that, you know, so that we didn't hear, didn't hear. And uh, the Labour Party paid the price for that um, in, in the so-called red wall districts. I mean, you know, I think that, that what people were, were, were worried about, they're feeling about, you know, the Brexit became the whole argument about leaving the EU as a proxy for the suffering of people and that somehow there was going to be a magical solution. And we didn't, you know, and that the failure to hear that, to talk to people. And friends of mine in the United States say the same thing about families divided over support for Trump, that people have, they've stopped being able to talk to each other. And that breeds, it breeds violence. It breeds hatred. And I think it, it, it breeds a kind of anti-democratic, because I, I do think that politics needs to be a place where people can really talk to each other, not share ideas. They have to be able, however, to discuss those ideas out of a sense of integrity, out of uh, a sense of, of public, good, and I'm afraid that I see very little of that in the government that we have right now. Um, I think, in fact, an unprecedented lack of it. Um, Thatcherism was a very bad time, but there were better people around her. Um, and um, and I don't know what Danny Kruger thinks, but in fact, you there know. were better people in the Conservative Party and they were forced out. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll come back to you in a second. Don't, don't, <laughs> but don't. First of all, Peter, <laughs> Peter you're, we brought Peter McFadden along you know, provide the traditional glamour that we need in Freedom Town Council meetings, but <laughs> we'd also like, like to, to invite you. I mean, what do you make of this conversation so far? You know, are, we, are we barking up the wrong tree, do you think, to expect to create a new kind of politics which is, which is driven by you know, the natural uh, uh, proclivity human beings have for empathy, compassion, altruism, those sorts of things. 
so you're saying that i'm not sure danny was saying that that there is that natural and and barbara yeah, that, i'd take a slightly more hobbesian view but yeah, yes, yeah yes, exactly yes, yeah. no and i absolutely agree with barbara i mean i think that, that we do have an that there is a goodness in everyone and my take is that it's a system that then kind of destroys that and then but what he described you know what he was saying and you could sort of the the the, the sort of i don't know what it was the atmosphere in the room when danny said his bit about we've got to have these two people who rip each other to pieces <laughs> that's how it works and if we don't have that the people won't have choice you could kind of see whatever this is 60 people go what was the hell was that about you know and that to me is com- that's insane and it's in complete contrast to what barbara's saying yeah. So, I mean, that's what, and, and you see, I think the real problem, it, which filtered right down to Froome and to towns and to parishes, is that that, that model, the Danny model, has, has come down right through. And so that, so that people, even, uh, you know, at this level, so when we had them, um, I can't remember the name of the council now, but the, ja- the famous Jackie Weaver mm. uh, yes. tweet and the yeah. Hamforth, thank you, uh, you know, which was, uh, went viral and that sort of uh, very vicious and violent little exchange then, which was a group of, of parish councillors tearing each other to pieces. I, I heard her later saying, oh, well, that's not, no, that's not normal. It was just one, you know, it just sort of happens. I'm thinking that is normal <laughs> at this level. I know I could, I, you know, I could sit and tell you stories all night of other councils that I know about in Britain where that sort of behaviour has happened. And where that's come from, I think, is the model of the top. Yeah. So, so while we continue to have... Uh, you know, I don't know who, <laughs> I better stop slagging Danny off, he's gone now, but, um, or maybe that's a reason to carry on, but it's kind of like when, 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 if that is the basis for how you run your, your, you know, you reach decisions, that seems to me to be completely ludicrous, mm-hmm. not en- mainly because it's completely unfair, because one lot's got all the power, I mean, so it's not fair, is it, because the Tories are going to win, what, at the moment, whatever they say, so you all shout, the, the Tories shout, Labour and the other lot shout, doesn't matter what anybody says because the Tory is going to win. So it's not, they're always, so it doesn't arrive at a consensus which people can, can um, uh, sign up to. It arrives at what the Tories were going to do anyway. Well, how's that democracy? So in, until that is fundamentally taken apart, and the only place to me where that's going to get taken apart or changed is here, is at a local level. And that's where what Barbara was saying and alluding to, and, on, and you did too, Sam, the... Um, you know, what happened during uh, when communities got together, the neighborhood network in Froome, those sorts of, of, of initiatives, that's where politics will change because it ain't going to change at the top because mm-hmm. it's a bare bit. Yeah. 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 John. Uh... <laughs> so when, when independence for Froome got going and I started... I met Peter properly for the first time and started talking about this. I sort of learned a hell of a lot because my approach to politics um, had been quite, and still is to some extent, you know, I, I, you know, I don't buy the idea that ideology is something you have to take out. You know, all of us are ideological, right? It's much in the same way that we're all good, essentially, you know. People, if you talk to them, you know, there are values differences between people. You know, my father-in-law votes conservative and we have the most terrible argument when he comes to visit. And he looks at the world in a very, very different way. You know, he's more on the Hobbes than the Rousseau end of it. I don't know whether he recognised it himself <laughs> in those terms necessarily. But um, so that's true, right? And I approach, and my, because I didn't know much about, about government, local government at this level, I... My approach to it was like that. I just thought, well, um, you know, surely to God, it must be the same. You have disagreements all the time. And then Peter explained what's in the two books that he's written and what I saw sort of happen um, in Froome close up. I wrote about it a couple of times, you know. And that, I wouldn't say it was revelatory necessarily, but it, it, I felt like it sort of put me right. And there are people I know in Froome who would say, oh, this is all a joke, you know, it's just like one monopoly party, and how can this possibly be right, and we should get back to the old system and all that. <laughs> but it, it, it was an education, really. And then you begin to see, I mean, it, it, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't really happened yet, but at the sort of next layer up, I can see how city government might work at least more, significantly more on that basis, you know. I think there's a... The issue with national politics comes back to this idea about whether this sort of hateful, somewhat misanthropic, think the worst of people element gets taken out. Because if you're faced with someone like Ian Duncan Smith, right, 
It was probably it. he's not shadow went through the room. Well, there you go. I was <laughs> gonna say I'm trying actually he's just someone I can't I can't mm. do anything else but assume the worst of. And then he even manages to go beneath my expectations, you know. It's very hard not to feel adversarial and angry and for politics to go that way. Because when you're faced with someone doing what he did, which goes back to what I said about how the benefit system changed and all that, that's that's sort of where you have to go. But the other thing is we carpeted the right of politics a lot here. So for the sake of sort of restoring a bit of balance, you know, <laughs> my side of politics, I mean, these are all generalizations, right? But my side of politics, the left of politics, that has sort of hateful, unkind aspects about it as well, right? So one of the most obvious ones, which is really rearing its head now in the social media age, right? Is it, is it, it tells the world it's kind and understanding and empathetic and the other side aren't. But the words that you hear a lot from people on the left are bigots, racist, transphobe. Some people are transphobic, no question. But not everybody who, who I see accused of being transphobic is a transphobe, you know. And on and on it goes. Left politics is really, really judgmental. Mm -hmm. Because left-wing people always feel they're on the moral high ground, and of course we are, right? <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you have, they have this tendency, and I include myself in this, right, to think that people who have a different view of the world are sort of morally degenerate, you know, because a lot of left-wing politics is sublimated religion, particularly in England and Wales and Scotland grew out of nonconformist religion. You know, it goes, but if you look at the history of the English Civil War and all that, that's when what we understand as left-wing politics was born, right? I mean, that's the tradition I'm from. I'm both sides of my family, Methodism runs very, very deep, right? And the, and the, the issue with, with, with politics of sublimated religion is it becomes very about heretics, you know, and mm. forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do and all this stuff, right? And left-wing politics um, suffers from that very, very often. Um, and it's to its detriment. And I think, to come back to something Barbara said, that's one of the reasons why the so-called red, the so-called red wall, and again, these are awful generalizations. No one in Stoke-on-Trent knows what the red wall is, and neither should they, you know, any more than they know what leveling up is. I mean, I don't even know what leveling up is, and I'm sure Danny Kruger doesn't either. But um, people then know, right, that the left sort of would have a sniff around and say, oh, you voted Brexit, didn't you? You must be a bigot. You must be an awful bloody racist, you know, and all of that. And some of the reason, because the Labour Party in the form of Jeremy Corbyn presented itself at its most sort of pious and moralistic and all of that. I mean, that whether you like or, or didn't like Corbyn, you know, my views on that are fairly well known. Um, if you read The Guardian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what people pick up, right? And people like Donald Trump trade on that. They say, I like you, you know, I accept you the way you are, you're all right. And these left-wing people, they want to put you in a correction camp, you know. And that's not true, but there's enough truth in it, in the way the left sometimes presents itself for people to believe it. And I think that that it's sort of unavoidable in left politics, that, because left politics is about morality. And as I said, these sort of quasi-religious aspects, but it's definitely there. And it can result in people who aren't kind at all. I mean, the most objectionable people on Twitter, by and large, are left wing. I, th I think that's an interesting point that Jacinda Ardern makes, isn't it? That the progressives do not have a no monopoly on good values and kind no, just most of them you know yeah yeah and um, <laughs> also obviously there's another there's another sort of trap here isn't it that in some respects a politics that is fired by anger or injustice is quite hard to 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 make compatible with a politics of kindness isn't it do you think or not no is, is not anger hard. not the opposite of kindness no not at all i think you'd be righteously kind you know uh, i think you know People who went on the march against the Iraq war were all pretty angry, but they were there for the for reasons of kindness and empathy and recognizing common humanity. So no, I don't buy that. And I think anger's unavoidable. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure people, I mean, for all I'm sure Froome Town Council get, I know they get very angry with Mendip District Council very often. So <laughs> <they do. laughs> all those who agree. <laughs> could I could I could I just come in very quickly on on the point which um uh I mean, uh, I I want to say I, how much I agree with uh, with what uh, John Hill just said about about the left. Um, um, uh, I had a very I mean I became very disillusioned with um, with Corbyn and that was a painful process and it involved some major fallings out with uh, with friends. Um, but um, I want to just raise one other thing, which I think is um, and, and just to go back to Rousseau for a moment, but many, many other thinkers, um, including ones uh, talked about by Peter Hennessy, and that is the concept of equality. 
I think that um, kindness in politics is completely wedded to a commitment to equality. And equality is a value. We, we live in something called a meritocracy, except that it's not a meritocracy. Nobody believes for a minute that, you know, that by your own efforts in this society, the way things are stacked right now, that people can really get right to the top. There are, I mean, of course there are examples, but I mean, you know, and I'm not gonna go on and on about the composition of our current government or uh, the role of the public schools, or now the government's move to narrow once again, the intake into the universities uh, as a kind of two pronged attack to ensure that, that young people from poor, backgrounds, people from uh, areas like the one I live in, you know, uh, black ethnic minority areas do not get to university. Equality as a driver of politics seems to me to be absolutely fundamental. It's a point that was made by Tawny many years ago. He was a Christian socialist, but I think, you know, but not of a kind of dogmatic pious variety, a, a man, a real thinker. And so I, I, I think it's hard to talk about equality today, but I think it's absolutely vital that we do so and that we fight for it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, the, the time for our conversation is now over, but I'm just wondering if you're willing to stay for a little bit longer, we could have a few, up, yeah, few yeah, questions. Yeah, course, yeah. Yeah. Barbara, would you be happy to have a few questions? Yes, that's fine, sure. Ex excellent. So. Um, uh, uh, Mark, we, we actually we have 23 people online watching this, which is which is great. Uh, are there any questions from the people online at all? There is there is one question from Denise Hunt. It's aimed at, at Danny, really. Danny spoke about kindness in debate in the context of kindness in politics. I'm more interested to understand how kindness is considered when making policy decisions. Great question. Shame Danny's not here to answer it, but maybe. I mean, uh, so. Uh, it, to sort of endorse something Danny did say, he was talking about the fact he wants a more relational sort of system of public services and all that. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the flaw in it, to not be Danny for a minute, <laughs> is that it, he was talking about Wigan and saying that the spark for a better kind of model of local services and so on was austerity, but that's the worst sort of spark for it. Right. So the point is what we didn't have when when Cameron, encouraged by people like Danny, actually, was very central to this, was talking about the big society. I actually found the big society quite an interesting idea. It wasn't particularly original or novel. It was quite an interesting idea. The idea that you get away from the big state. You know, because if you go to the job centre, for example, I think the supply of health service, if you're not careful, it can be a very sort of alienating and personal experience. So that sense, in that sense, Danny's right. You know, for someone who sits there and says, hello, you know. Right. How can I? What, how can I sort of impose what I think is the right answer to your problem on you? You know, and even now, you know, God, you know, thank God we've got the NHS. But I, you know, I've had, we've all experienced. If you've got the doctor and you say, "Well, I think this is wrong with me," and they look at you aghast, like, "Well, what's I got to do with you?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let alone job centre. I mean, a job centre. When I was briefly on the dole, this is a long time ago, but this really hit me like a hammer because you used to turn up and there was someone behind a big. It's not so much like that now, but the same attitudes remain. There was someone behind a, behind a bit of plate glass, you know, and you would sit there in this room full of cigarette smoke, this is the 1980s, it was a long time ago, and they sort of summon you up. And again, it was sort of like, hello, please give me my gyro, you know. And the state is still too like that, you know. But the point is, if you want to devolve it, and if you want to make it relational, you know, and the benefit system should certainly be like that. It shouldn't work on the basis of national targets and any of that. It should work on the on the basis that people very local to you should be brokering job opportunities and talking about how you went to work and if you want to do that and all the rest of it. You can't do that in a system of, in a, in a in conditions of austerity. That needs enabling, right? And one of the great lessons of the last ten or fifteen years, actually, is that. You won't get that until you spend significantly more money on public services. I mean, that's just true. You know, decentralization well, that doesn't tend to work unless it's adequately funded, because otherwise what you just get on the end of it is a different sort of crap, to be blunt. Mm. That was Danny Kruger there, speaking from the <laughs> anyone, anyone here got a question they'd like to ask? Um, Mike, you, you were quickest off the mark there. <laughs> Um, I listened to <clears throat> Thought for the Day this morning, uh, was a, a Buddhist, and he was talking about kindness in politics. 
And he said, well, how does that extend? You know, he's extended on and does that extend to Putin? And I was thinking of Barbara's um, uh, question about, you know, what, what motivates Putin? And I was also reading some analysis on Twitter today of, yes, what does, what it is, what is it that's motivating Putin? And actually what the Buddhist said was, when we come to a discussion, we have our own version of past hurts that we bring to that. So if we look at what's motivating Putin is a whole long history of a thousand year history of hurts that he's trying to, trying to fix by this kind of, uh, by, by this action. Uh, and the question that I have really leads on from, from there to say, how do we have dialogue with people who have a completely different version? And there are people in Froome, for example, who believe that Putin is actually another, another messiah come like Trump was to root out the evils in society. Okay. I'm afraid there are. Send them to Shepton Mallet. Yep. Are they the ones who think that are they the same ones who think 5G caused the pandemic? Because I meet a lot of them. Probably them too. And that they think that the, the whole thing of uh, the war in Iraq is actually a fake and it's all using old oh, yeah, footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this same kind of thing. So how do you have a dialogue with people like that where the basis of which to have a discussion isn't actually there? Good question. You can answer it then. <laughs> Barbara, uh, do you have a thought on Barbara, Go Barbara yeah. first? I'm <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean the, the, you know, Don mentioned the problems created by social media, and I think it's, it, this is a really tough one, and, and I don't have, no, I don't have any answers to that. I mean, on the one hand, you know, it opens the world up to democratic forces. I mean, you know, the, the, in, in so many places, people have been able to use, um, you know, phones the, 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 and so on to, 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 to create opposition, um, to link up with each other in ways uh, to learn from each other and so on. And at the same time, I mean, what is pumping through and having the most devastating effect on people, um, you know, from not, not just at the political level, but the personal level. I mean, there are plenty of studies of, 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 of mental health uh, among younger people and the impact of, of, of social media on that. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's I mean, I just want to say one one quick point, which is that about um, I'm I'm actually running a big project right now on on solitude and loneliness, and um, and I think I mean um, one of the when 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 um, uh, the, you know we were before the pandemic. I just want to make this point very quickly. I actually made it in the Guardian, but somebody is that we were hearing about terrible loneliness epidemic, loneliness epidemic everywhere. People were you know dying, like smoking a pack a day, and so on and so forth. And um, and what was and that was a proxy for the destruction of public services across this country, for the fact that that, that, that you know that places where people could go and share lives together in in for libraries, community centers, um, places that, that, that elderly, bus services slashed everywhere. And what I said is this is and and then a government which at that point was handling the pandemic so badly, you know, and, and, and as we now know, and I think I can say this here, corruptly, I mean, the Good Law Project has actually shown the degree of corruption that has gone on in this government, that we were left I, I, as solitary citizens, left inside a kind of loneliness where, you know, where we, we, we can't even turn to the people whose job it is to be looking after us. And I think right now, the task that Hennessy and, and, and John and you know, his guardian work and, and many, many good people in politics, but also just out there in communities are trying to do is in a sense to cut through some of the real loneliness that has been created in our society today. Uh, and I think, and again, I mean, these are all linked up ambitions, it seems to me, toward a more equalitarian, a juster, a fair society in which, you know, like my disabled neighbor next door doesn't have to make a choice between exactly as John was describing, um, between turning on some heat, um, you know, or, or getting some food when the local food bank runs out and she has to buy something. John, you look as though you want to come in. I, 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 I'd certainly have some more questions, but that's a really interesting point, a question that you raised, right, which is about the fact that, you know, in Froome, probably, you know, more than some places, 
there are people with somewhat um what I consider to be somewhat sort of out there opinions about this and that. Um, I think the point, and then this this point about Putin and, and past cruelties. I mean, that may or may not be true, you know. And I'm sure Hitler had a dread, dreadful childhood, and so did Stalin and all that. But in the end, some people are just. But I think in the end, you just have to you have to just work on the basis that some people are inexplicably nasty bastards, you know, and the world would be better off without them, you know. I'm Honestly, just... I mean, I mean we, you know, you and there are people on Twitter. I mean, there was this the woman who put this poem up the other day saying, "If I'd been Putin's mother, I'm shut up," you know. <laughs> I mean, it's needless, and it's and also it's condescending and insulting to people who are losing their lives, apart from anything else. Mm. I think you have to be not you personally, but I think that that if one isn't careful, you know, one can overanalyze. You know, amateur psychoanalysis on dictators. I think this is a fairly sort of futile endeavor. You know, <laughs> having said that, this this other point. So about people who, who believe all sorts of things, you know, and the prevalence of conspiracy theory in the modern world and so on. That's a really interesting question, right? And I think the point is you have to try, right? That's, that's the, the basic point, is you have to try and engage and don't write people off. So I wrote a, a column in The Guardian, just to find the, those of you who spend £2.50 or whatever it is on it every day, or at least on Saturdays, like most people, um, <laughs> pays for my children's food, I can assure you. Um, I wrote a piece about anti-vaxxers, and people, or vaccine refusers, shall we say, um, saying that you have to understand it, you know, completely understand it. But if you're someone who's had a, a history of pretty awful relationship with the state, if your benefits have been stopped, or you feel your children have been taken into care unfairly, or whatever it is, certainly if you're a person of colour, right, you might have been roughed up with the police, or any number of experiences, right, you'll feel pretty distant and sceptical from the state. And if they now say that we want you to report here on Thursday at 10 o'clock, and we're going to stick a needle in your arm, right, and, and coupled yeah. with that, you've read things on Facebook about the fact that Bill Gates might put a chip in your arm or you might get sick. I totally understand why people feel like that. Same yeah. way I understand why, you know, people who live in um, Devizes or Bruton's probably a good place. People who vote, who live in Bruton, who voted for Brexit. I got no sympathy or empathy with them at all, right? <laughs> because you cannot possibly claim, I'm sure there are poverty stricken parts of Bruton, but you know. If you eat in the chapel, that place in Bruton, and you voted for Brexit, well, you're an idiot, right? I haven't, I haven't got any sympathy for that at all, because you can't claim to be politically alienated and all that, for God's sake, right? But when I was in Stoke on Trent, for example, you know, during the referendum, I had four pints of lager there, one Thursday night, and I had a wobble, because I thought, well, if I lived here, I'd probably vote for Brexit, because the ballot paper would look like, you know, screw you, politicians, or not screw you, politicians, and I'd vote screw you, politicians. So on that basis, I think you're context and wider understandings and all that are really really important but they have their limits and their limit you know lies about 100 miles towards me of where vladimir putin is at that point i have to stop all those people you know by the tofu fridge in the health food shop who think that putin's god's gift and 5g caused the pandemic you know, i'm not quite that's a little bit difficult <laughs> I think that point about amateur psychoanalysis is actually really important. It's that we we sort of sit in judgment on 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 political figures that we know very little about. Uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, dialogue process advocated by Oliver Ramsbottom, who's the, was the professor of peace studies at Bradford, called agonistic dialogue. And this is dialogue which is based not on any attempt to find common ground, but its whole purpose is to try and understand other people's positions. And in particular, to dispense with all the assumptions, prejudices we have about the other person. And so it is possible to have that kind of dialogue, as long as you're not trying to set out to, to find a consensus or common ground. But the mutual understanding of difference might be the starting point for yeah. change. Yeah. I, think mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah. that's it. so, yeah. um, I think we've got time for a couple more. Um, Peter at the back, yes. yes. And then Shane. Yeah. Um, I'm not a conservative. <laughs> As a political historian, I'm interested in uh, what conservatism is. And it seems to me that there are two strands that one can be kind about and understand. One is goes back to Robert Peel, who really defined modern conservatism. He, he accepted uh, reality, the reality of the distribution of power. And, uh, but if there was a huge crisis or a demand, then power yielded to that. And so he accepted the reform bill of uh, 1832, which he had opposed at the time. And he also led to the, uh, le led the repeal of the uh, Corn Laws. And I find this is an understandable idea of conservatism uh, because power is conservative by its very nature. And we live in a world where there's power and a distribution of power, and we can't automatically change that. Uh, 
The other strand I find uh, interesting and not unattractive uh, was uh, through the work of Roger Scruton, a conservative philosopher who died a few years ago. And he talked about rather sentimentality, values like family, religion, habit, and all the rest of it. And I think uh, no one has been talking for conservative, but it has to be a non-conservative, perhaps even an anti-conservative to argue the case. I think when you're judging the present uh, government, it's because they're not upholding these more traditional, perhaps paternalistic, but caring values. There was some, I don't often uh, respond favorably to Michael Gove, but he said something the other day that I thought was quite interesting about leveling up, whatever that is. But he said that um, there's an equality of talent throughout the country, but not an equality of opportunity. And to try and bridge that, I think, if it fits into conservative values, is something one can empathize with. I go back to what you were just saying about understanding the people that you don't agree with. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, good point. Um, I, I didn't hear a question mark at the end of that, so, so Shane, do, you, do you agree? <laughs> uh, Shane, you, you next, and then, and then Neil at the back, and then, then I don't know your name, but... Um, yeah, my question was sort of partly about politics, or kindness in politics, but also just kindness in day-to-day in -day life, which then is often reflected in politics. And I think kindness, often comes from a position of security, whether that's financial, family, community. Um, you know, that if, if you have that sense of security, then I think it's a lot easier to yeah, be yeah. kind. Um, and I think now we are having, you know, the welfare state is, is, is falling apart quite considerably. Um, and um, my thinking and my question really to, to the, the panel, uh, my feeling is that one of the key social policies to provide security is, a, is a, a, a universal basic income because it provides a mattress as we go through the next few decades of essentially transitioning from fossil to silicon, you know, hopefully without the climate disaster that looks like it's going to come. But we're going to, now I think we can all agree we're going to be heading through really tempestuous decades and giving everybody that same share of the common wealth of this country through a universal basic income scheme. You know, I, I think it's really important and I was really hoping David Warburton would be here to put that question to him. <laughs> But um, but yeah, what what do the uh, the panel feel about a UBI as a sort of uh, important mattress? I can, uh, yeah, I can say uh, I, I agree with you. I think it would be uh, really important. I, I just add that there would be no point in saying it to David because he's got no power. Because this, the way that the system works is we don't live in a democracy, so you could have said it and it wouldn't make any difference. But that's just in passing. I agree with you <laughs> completely that um, uh, it, it would be good, and particularly now. To have that but there is a point that you said at the beginning that uh, i think that you were saying that uh, that people who have that security are more likely to be generous and there was something i can't remember now if uh, it, um, which of you it was anita or barbara was saying you know the generosity that you see from communities uh, the support will be that will be coming for ukrainians will be from poorer people you know they, they will, the biggest the what well, most of the food that goes into the food bank comes from people going into um you know the poorer of the of the supermarkets in Froome. And so there's something, I'm not quite sure how that interplays, maybe it doesn't, but there, there's something about that, that yeah, yeah. it's the people, you know, who, who, who have the least who are often the most generous, yeah. isn't it? Which, I'm not contradicting the need for you, which I think is really important. It's a st statistical fact that middle-class people cheat more than yes. people lower down the income scale. That's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's an anthropological fact. You have to sort of be confident enough to cheat, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but what Shane says, really sort of resonates with me i mean it's it's complicated by what 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 peter says and in the case of mutual aid for example i was really struck by the fact that um places that had almost like the least aid to to be mm. mutual with you know uh, were the most sort of dedicated to it notwithstanding the fact that it took root in them in lots of more affluent places as well but i think the point is that politics will be dysfunctional i mean politics in the sense of the most visceral sort of grassroots, how we all relate to each other. And then 
where that sits in our heads when we come to vote, right? Politics from the bottom up. The thing that really screws that up and sends it in all sorts of horrible directions is fear, right? So not for nothing, the white paper, which had the, the, the creation of the health service in it, and Aaron Bevan's white paper, and in fact, a collection of an Aaron Bevan speeches is called In Place of Fear, famously, mm -hmm. right? And the reason, because that's the point. Human beings, uh, if you are at their most sort of confused and sometimes seemingly irrational when they're scared, mm -hmm. right? And this, this plays into this question of why, notwithstanding the people in Bruton, if they exist, <laughs> all the bloody Brexit voters in the chapel, but um, <laughs> why uh, people in, in a lot of places where I spent a lot of time in, in the build-up to the referendum and after it, for that, for that matter, the reason that, they, that some people there, not all, you know, some people vote with Brexit because they wanted out the European Union, you know, and they talked about Brussels being a super state. So it's not entirely true that all of it was reduce, reducible to other things, you know. Be careful with that because that's condescending, right? To pat people on the head and say, I know you voted for this because of, you, you say it's this, but actually what you really meant was this. And what they tend to say is, no, I didn't like the European Union. So you piss off, Mr. Condescending Guardian <laughs> journalist, right? But um, at the same time, clearly fear was a factor in it, right? Because you, how can you possibly think about the future and security and have confidence in it and have confidence in politicians locally and nationally if a great deal of your life is spent scared out your wits i think that's i mean that's just that's true and that's the greatest casualty to my mind of the sort of withdrawal of the welfare state is is the arrival back in back in the life we all share of fear right that's one point and then the second point the gentleman at the back it's like been going back to university robert peel and jean-jacques russo in one evening <laughs> it's really rife with my mind going god i my worst essay in my finals was about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> and if I'd had time, the second worst would have been about Robert Peel. But um, <laughs> it's dead right, that thing. I mean, Robert Scru Roger Scruton, in all sorts of respects, wasn't a very nice person. I didn't have very nice views about various things. But um, he was right about some of these elements of conservatism, which I feel myself profound. I'm quite sort of conservative with a small c in a lot of my political instincts, in the sense that, I think, I mean, one of the reasons I live in Froome is because I like being rooted. I like a sense of place and the continuities that come with it. And I miss some institutions that aren't there anymore. You know, I didn't like it when post offices started closing down. You know, mm. I have an, a strange, you know, when I see a red phone box, the reasons I can't quite explain, my heart lifts slightly. <laughs> you know what I mean? All that stuff about old, all that stuff in Orwell about old maids cycling to communion through the morning mist and the, Sound of Leather and Willow, which John Major then misused. You know, that, that resonates with me. I'm not a patriot, you know, but I'm quite sort of glad I live here. You know, I feel very connected to the landscape and all of that. And sometimes left politics leaves that to the right to make hay with. I was really, I had this very visceral sense of that. I was on a Guardian job once and we came over a hill. This was out in the former coalfields of Derbyshire and there were all these hills there. And I, I turned around to the person who was with me and I said, it's awful, you know, that. Nigel Farage appropriates England for his own uses, you know, because I feel as emo they're probably more emotionally connected to it in my own way. And I'm sure we all do as any of those people. And I think we forget those things too easily. I also think we, I think left-wing people are far too sniffy about religion. You know, it's another thing that Scruton would say, you know, at the risk of being sounding terribly controversial. I don't like the Richard Dawkins view of things. I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic, and I don't judge people who have religious belief. I don't think it's irrational. I think it exists on a completely different philosophical plane. The questions of truth and falsity and all of that stuff, and I respect it. And for all that it makes some people do horrible things, I've met lots and lots of people who religion is motivated to do all sorts of amazing things. Mm. So I'm not judgmental about that at all. And again, I think the modern left is uh, sometimes is very sniffy about religion, and I don't like it. Mm. We have um, we've got two more questions from Phil, but I'd quite like to just bring in one of the online uh, audience here. Uh, so a question from Adam Boyden online. Um, well, he should be here. What's the matter with him? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't mention why, but he does ask, um, are the, excuse me a second, are the current policy appraisal assessment tools like the equality impact assessment sufficient to assess how policies affect people or do we need something new in the toolbox? <laughs> I don't need a Liberal Democrat for that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, too, it's too technical. Yeah, it is a bit so, yeah, There is an answer to that, which is that clearly they're not sufficient. Mm. 
He says it's full, by the way. Well, as far as I understand it, the government, albeit reluctantly, is obliged to run a quality impact assessment, but they still cut people's benefits and cut council's budgets and all the rest of it. So clearly something isn't working. I think I I think on Adam's part, that's probably a rhetorical question. Mm. You must know that. He's a good sort. He is. Um, so, yeah, hey, Simon. Yeah. There. For your next question. Right. So I only said jump, that I know that she's been there for a long time. We've got two more, and then that will probably be it. So, <laughs> I thought I thought some woman ought to speak this evening as well as Barbara. So, yeah, um, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, to raise the issue of of how, in in a sense, evil is uh, comes along one step at a time in small steps. The the idea of the banality of evil that uh, Hannah Arendt, I think, said, mm. and that's what we're doing, I feel, at the moment, that, that when uh, we're, we're, I don't want to, dis, to um, collate disagreeing with the way we go about uh, debate. I think there's nothing wrong in disagreeing. Mm. But when we start making the Jimmy Savile comment, um, when, when it becomes normalised that people lie and get away from, with it, and people uh, tell untruths and, and are unkind, that was an unkind statement, and get away from it. And our colleagues, our other MPs, turn a blind eye. They, the only thing that got um, people really up in arms, where 100 MPs stood against the government, was, um, w was when Johnson wanted to bring in um, greater controls over wearing masks and things, so, which was a kind thing to do. It was, it was done for people. So I think it really, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about Putin, who's a kind of end point, or Trump, who's an end point. But, but the, the way that politics normalises um, the way we do things, the way we're unkind, you know, the way we lie, is up to all of us to, to stand up for um, integrity, truth, and, and the way we treat each other. So just, um, I just yeah, yeah. Uh, wanted to make that point. Thank yeah, yeah. you. Simon? Barbara, do you want to comment on that? No, I just, I just, I just agreed with it um, so very, very much. I, I just want, I just want to tell you very quickly. If any of you are ever coming to visit Tottenham, I want to show you uh, kindness in action um, in um, uh, a place called Lordship Wreck, uh, which is behind Broadwater Farm, notorious for um, the uh, uh, the Broadwater Farm riots, and um, and the um, and Lordship Wreck is um, uh, great big playing fields um, in which has created a community hub and um, which, is, which is a beautiful um, eco building, it has wonderful playgrounds, there's a pond and so on and so forth. I, I won't go on about it, but at Community Rec, when you go there, you see London, you see all of London. Well, no, you see, you see all of London in Herringay. I mean, you see uh, lots and lots of, 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 of people from every ethnic minority. They prepare meals. Uh, you can go in and have, uh, you know, for, for very little money or no money, you can have meals. Uh, Bernie Grant um, of, of, of Tottenham fame, uh, his, um, his wife has, has been involved with this. And there was something called the Herringay Development Vehicle, which was going to destroy Broadwater Farm, take over much of uh, the Lordship wreck, and essentially you know, destroy this whole area, which it's all three minutes away from me. And people mobilized, the community mobilized, and they overturned the Herringay Development Vehicle, which was a sellout to, to, to developers and have created Lordship wreck in its place. So if you're coming, if you're ever coming my way, um, I, I invite you to go and look at Lordship Wreck and see kindness and politics together in action. Thank you. Neil, Neil, I think you've... Um, can we have another question from a woman at, at the end? At least one. <laughs> Seriously, I'm quite happy to hand over to a woman if somebody wants to put their hand up and take the microphone from me. Yeah, take your microphone from me then, eh? <laughs> then, then um, <laughs> less of a question, more of a challenge for the audience. And that's if, which I assume there is a consensus that kindness starts with us, then 
I think there are two things that I will challenge you to do. The first is that when you leave here and for the rest of this week and next week and for the rest of your lives, <laughs> you engage not just with the people that you like and you agree with, but you engage with the people that you think you won't agree with and you might not like online and in the streets of room. And then my second challenge, which might be quite difficult for some people, is that if David Warpin is not here because he is unwell, I think we should all send him our best wishes for getting well again. Not because we agree with him, and he certainly knows from the emails I send him that I don't agree with him, but because he's a human being with a partner and with children like people all over the world, and we should extend our kindness to people locally and to him. So that's my challenge. Um, I was skeptical about the David Warburton thing just because I tried to see him as constituency surgery and he cancelled the day of it. Um, so I, I, I was felt bad about that, and I will write to him to make him see if he feels better. Um, you don't have to feel bad about it. It's all right. I think he'll get over it. Um, hopefully. It would be bad if he didn't. I'd feel terrible. But the uh, question that I had is, how do we get kindness to matter more? Because a lot of politicians in opposition, not least David Cameron, talked about uh, gross national well-being and, you know, Jacinda has talked about it and everything. That's amazing. But her popularity is sort of nosedived with the COVID uh, sort of restrictions, letting people in there. So a lot of people, politicians talk about how much they care about kindness. Um, but generally from a sort of branding perspective, rather than actually something that they then endorse and sort of do in their everyday work and I moved to Frame last year and I think that the fact there is a kindness festival is great but um, I worked with David Cameron on international aid and I've worked for Bill Gates's foundation and got a lot of hostility for that and I try to engage with people who disagree with me about it but then there comes a point when you just think okay well, well we're not going to agree and I'd rather just dodge that whole thing than get a lot of abuse from you for something that you know I believe it otherwise I wouldn't do it but I'm only prepared to go so far and have that conversation because after that it just becomes self-defeating. So yeah, how do we make kindness matter more? <laughs> mm. So can I just do this really quickly? Too, yeah. In the sense that, so you've just come relatively recently to live in Prue. So I, I'm no longer a local politician, which I was for eight years. And, and I think that what happened in Froome was, was kind of what you're talking about, that, that what we did right from the beginning is we were kind to people. Or we, we really tried to properly engage with people. We did engage with people. We took the seriousness. No, we didn't take the seriousness. We took the formality out of, out of, uh, out of politics and enabled proper conversations. And I think that's why people then went on to elect you know, there were 10 of us in the first uh, council elected 17, the next time elected 17, the next time. And I think I think that's how it can be done from the from the grassroots board by by looking at people. And I'm sitting here, I think of a conversation which I won't spend ages talking about with a very angry man who was sitting just over there at the back in a meeting that I was chairing. And because we gave him long enough or I gave him long enough, you know, after a little while, when he would said his bit, I could say, so do you feel heard? And he said, yes, thank you very much. And actually, he, came, he stayed the rest of that meeting and he came back to the next meeting. And I think in traditional politics, I probably would have got him thrown out. Yeah. You know, I didn't agree with what he was saying, but that's not the point. The point was that it was about the relationship. And I think that's what this is about. And you can only do that at a community level. And maybe that's why you live in Froome. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Final thoughts. Uh, Barbara, would you like to offer just any concluding? Oh. Ah, I'm just conscious we're now way, way, way over time. OK, one more. You owe me a drink. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't have a question until um, Neil set his challenges. And my question is, is kindness really kindness if you don't mean it? Neil's challenge to um, send good wishes and kindness to Warburton, if I do that with zero integrity because I don't mean it, is that actually kindness? Oh, good question. Good question. <laughs> 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 What an answer. Let me say something apropos of that, actually. There's a quote here from the, I mentioned before, um, the, uh, the, the uh, Scottish uh, National Performance Framework for Scotland, which talks about kindness. And 
a bad definition of kindness actually relates to this. It says the things that people do for one another, both practically uh, and emotionally, in response to moments of perceived need, when there is an option to do nothing. I think this thing about perceived need is actually, you're right, that, that a kindness, which is simply an act into the void, may be something else. But uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so a couple of final thoughts. You look troubled by that, John. But I'm troubled by everything. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, would you like to offer any, any concluding thoughts on this? Not really. I mean, I think, I think, I think, um, I mean, on the, on the question just raised, I would say that um, your motives don't necessarily determine whether or not an act is kind. Um, I mean, I think it's the effect on the other person. And um, so, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're people of very mixed motives and we often don't know quite what it is that we're up to. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, if, if, if the effect on the other person is to make them feel better about themselves in ways that, you know, we can endorse, then I think we can call that kindness. Um, I, I don't think we can look for purity in our, in our, in our motives. And, I, and I, I think the example, I'm, I'm fascinated by the example of local involvement and from, because that's exactly, I mean, what I keep saying to myself is I have a plan for my retirement, which is to um, go over and get fully involved in Lordship Rec and maybe from there to get involved and in, more involved in local politics. I think if we want change, we're going to have to build it. Um, and I suppose that's, that's, you know, for those of us who have the luxury, as I do, of being able to make choices about the way I lead my life, many, most people, perhaps increasing numbers of people in this country, don't have that choice at all. So. Okay, thank you. John, uh, final thoughts? I'm gonna end up sound, I'm gonna end sounding optimistic, which isn't like me. Um, so uh, just first of all, this question about whether, if it's sort of put on kindness, does it count? It's a really good question. British people sometimes have this really funny idea about um, being polite, don't they? Like they say, oh, isn't it awful when they say, have a nice day? Well, why is that awful? And they go, well, they don't mean it. Well, so what do you want them to say? Bugger off and never come back. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's all right, isn't it? Even if you're not feeling it, it's, it's, so, it, it's better to pretend than not do it at all. <laughs> also, I don't believe you're so hardcore that David Warburton having fallen down the stairs, you wouldn't wish him a speedy recovery, unless you are, but I don't, you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I might be quite glad I don't, with the sound of it. <laughs> No, even if Nigel Farage fell down the stairs, I'd check if he was all right. Do you know what I mean? I think I would, yeah. No, I know. Are you kidding? I know I would. Are you kidding? If Vladimir Putin fell down the stairs, I'd make sure he was all right. It's not in, in built into us all. There you go, you see? I like you. Get to know each other. Um, now, on this other question about how do we actually do this, which the gentleman there raised, you know, how do you build kindness into politics? I mean, these are very difficult questions, you know. What Barbara said about that community project in Harringay, I think is really interesting. When we, make, when we were making uh, the videos we make for The Guardian, anywhere but Westminster, and another election came around in 2019, and by that time we were on to our sort of fifth election or referendum in, you know, three years. It was getting silly. So we, we just was always saying, oh, I want to talk to politicians. You know, we'd already sort of come to that conclusion. And most, in every film we made in 2019, at the heart of it, there was a what we, we had it, I had to call them community projects. They always end up you end up using these horrible, cold, cliche terms, and it's not right, you know, because they're much more than that, always. And we just did it everywhere we went. We went to one of these places and we sort of made those the crux of the film. They weren't a lot of the films were about Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson or any of that. And what what happens a lot in the films, if you watch them, and I still think this is I keep asking, well, how do you get from this to politics? How, what's the transmission system from you know, people in Grimsby who took over this disused school and it's an, it's an incubator for businesses and there's a crash and there's a, a loneliness group. And, you know, those what, like shed groups for largely for men when they all get together and they talk about their emotions and all of that. Like, how do you do it? And we still don't know the answer to that question. You know, the closest anywhere has got without wanting to be too sort of hometown boosterish, I think, is here. Which is probably why you live here. It's certainly why I continue to live here. I, there's nowhere else I'd rather live, really, apart from... New York or something, but I can't afford it. So, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, I think you see it there somehow. And the question, and Peter and I have this conversation very often, you know, what do you, where does it go? Where, so, and that's a very worthwhile conversation. But to end on an optimistic note, 
I think the world, or certainly this country, is getting better in all sorts of respects along these lines, right? A really good example of this is we're not as buttoned up anymore. When I, when I do this thing as part of my job, which I have to do, which is stop complete strangers in the street, it's a very strange way to behave, <laughs> and ask them about their lives. Because before we get to politics, we always ask about their lives. You know, The BBC just throws them against the wall and says, what do you think, Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> what the hell? You know, we say, how are you doing? You know, and all these people, oh, wow, okay, right, I'll talk to you. And um, people talk about their mental health now. It's a really good example of this, right? Now, the world in which I grew up, you know, I'm 52. The world in which I grew up, nobody talked about their mental health. No one had any idea about this, you know. And that's a more empathetic world. And one of the reasons for it, I think, is the internet. Because the internet reminds you that everyone's damaged, you know. Everyone's a bit messed up and anxious and all of that. And once you know that, you feel relaxed enough to say that about yourself. And then once you do that, inherently, you're sort of recognizing those traits or attributes in other people, you know, and you have some basis on which to communicate and all of that. And I think the world is better in that respect. And if you go down the age range, you know, I can say this for, for certain. My kids are kinder than I was at their age. Definitely. Right. And people, you know, if you read the Daily Mail, they have all these problems about, oh, they're going overboard on anti-bullying training. Well, the more anti-bullying training, the better. And I'm glad kids have this vernacular in which to talk and think about how they treat each other because I didn't you know we used to throw each other in the school pond and make <laughs> each other's dinner money and it was just horrible let alone the way we treated teachers you know and my kids aren't like that and then you see other thus far and then other um <laughs> uh, my daughter's 12 so it could go either way but, uh, <laughs> and then the other the other thing which I think shows you this is there are things in the culture tantalizingly close to politics that are much more empathetic. And the best example in the last two or three years is Marcus Rashford. Mm -hmm. That finally, after a lot of us wanting this, this sort of vivid, urgent sense of how awful poverty was in this country, is in this country, he didn't really feel it was breaking through. And then Mark, the brilliant Marcus Rashford mm -hmm. from Withenshaw, South Manchester, did what he did and continues to do. And suddenly you found that people were very receptive to that. People weren't judgmental and nasty and like George Osborne thought they were. And more to the point, this was being talked about on, on them. I switched on a game show, you know, like a family fortune catch rate. And they mentioned Marcus Rashford and how awful it was about holiday hunger. I thought, wow, something's changing here. And I think because there aren't just four channels of TV anymore and we don't just watch the news once a day and there's much more space for that sort of narrative to get out, I think we'll hear more of that. And between that and this generational shift, I think it doesn't apply to everywhere, as we know, as we're seeing very vividly on our TV screens at the moment. But I think that in this country and elsewhere gives me enough cause for hope. And in that sense, the world, notwithstanding all the horrors that we see and all the, the polarization that we've talked about, there's another side to everything, which is that I think people are becoming more empathetic and kind. And that's sort of what gets me out of bed in the morning. So, um, you have just witnessed John being optimistic, which is a rare event, which is a good event to a good moment to end on, I think. So, I'm not going to say any more except to say a thank you to Simon who made this happen. I've really enjoyed it this evening, I mean, it's been a great conversation. <laughs> um. So it's my pleasure to thank Professor Barbara Taylor. I do recommend uh, both of the books, but in particular this new one, How Compassion Can Transform Our Politics, Economy and Society. And you navigate in this, for instance, the, the distinctions between compassion, empathy, uh, kindness and well-being. And I think those, those distinctions are actually very interesting. But I just wanted to finish by just about one thing that really jumped out at me from what you said in your conclusions here. And you say, we are all social beings in whom kindness vies with envy and hate and with aggressivity as a defense against vulnerability. Acknowledging this psychological reality is essential for true kindness. So, so I think that takes us out of the, away from the idea of, of uh, um, kindness as some sort of piety and roots it in a much more detailed 
uh, uh, understanding of the reality of human suffering, which I think is really important. So thank you. Thank you very much to John Harris from The Guardian. Thank you. And uh, Peter, thank you very much for, for standing in. And uh, thank you to David, who was willing to do this. And I think he was genuinely interested in it. And I think we'll, we'll try and find another time for him to come back and have a conversation. We've got to buy a card now. Yeah. So, We've got to buy a card, haven't we? And we all got to sign a card. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, and um, we'll send him best wishes on behalf of Froome in his hospital bed. Yes, yes. And and rumours that Liz Truss pushed him down the stairs are completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the festival thing. Um, not just thank you to the panelists and everything tonight, but also thank you. venue for sorry thank you does that work um Froome town hall offered this venue for free just as they have for the last couple of nights which we're so grateful for and this amazing tech team um so really i'd love to have a round of applause yeah. for the tech hey. team um, and then there's the stewards and the kindness crew who've been working all week um speaking of all week there are a few days of the festival still to go um, do have a look at the website. As you know, everything is free except for one event, which is tomorrow night, um, which is Dr. Phil Hammond at the Merlin. Um, and that's our fundraiser. We're actually going to get income from that. And if you don't know Dr. Phil, um, he was doing the MD column in Private Eye all the way through the pandemic. And so we're going to get an amazing evening of kind of humour and um, thoughtfulness and I think very, very interesting observations about the last couple of years from him. I mean, the theme I gave him was kindness in the pandemic. So um, please, there are still tickets, so please do think about coming along to that if you want to. Um, and the final thing to say is that this festival, um, which was all organized at pretty short notice as a sort of just a punt to see what happens, is gonna come back next year, we hope. Um, but this year I had no public funding at all. We still haven't covered our costs. So if you've enjoyed it, if you appreciate it, there is a box outside. Thanks very much. Thank you.